Okay, so we'll start now the, the last lecture of Kevin Costell. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. Um, so I want to pick up where we left off last time and uh, discuss how uh, Stokes' theorem appears in the theory of differential forms. So, suppose we have a manifold with boundary, which means there are local, there are, there are two types of local coordinate patches. with so here's what your manifold might look like it has some it has some boundary so there's two types of patches one type of patch lies in the middle one type of patch is oh, it's given by uh, we have coordinates y1 yk which are in some ball in or k. And there's also boundary patches. Y1 to Yk as before, but now we take Y1 to be non-negative, and the boundary is when this is equal to zero. So this guy, with Y1 to Yk, which live in some ball, except that this guy is non-negative, so this patch looks like this, some kind of half of a ball that describes a region on, uh, which includes the boundary. So, uh, so if M is orientable, and in K, And you also want, it's a kind of technical remark, you want it to be compact so that the integral converges, but let's not to worry too much about that if you don't know what that means. Then we can integrate for, uh, we can integrate a k-form over m. Just in the same way we did before, we just divide it up into patches, do the integral in each patch. Notice that cha change of coordinates on the local patches doesn't, uh, doesn't affect the integral because uh, the change of coordinates picks up a Jacobian factor. So what Stokes' theorem says is that the integral over m of the Duram operator applied to a k minus 1 form is the integral of the boundary of m of the k minus 1 form. Okay, so this is kind of a familiar kind of statement. It's a much cleaner way of writing things that applies uniformly to all manifolds and all dimensions than what we saw in dimension 3. In dimension three, when you were dealing with surface integrals, it got a bit kind of nasty with how, how do you write this, you know. You had, you had all these, uh, I don't know, it seemed a bit confusing to me anyway, the traditional way of writing it in dimension three. So how do we prove this? So let's divide M into cubes. Like this. And it continue, it's going to continue in most directions, but I'm drawing it so that here is the boundary of M. Okay, so we're we're cutting our manifold up into cubes. And most, you know, in the interior, each cube is surrounded on all sides by other cubes. But on the boundary, 
one side of the cube is left open. And each cube is oriented, so I'm drawing it in dimension 2, so there are squares. So our manifold has a consistent orientation, so I can draw an orientation on each square in this case, and they kind of match up when they are joined by, an e by a, a face. Now the integral of my form is equal to the sum over the cubes of the integral over the cube of the form. This is one way to define the integral. And now, what we're going to do is say, well, we know uh, w if we have a, just a cube in flat space, the integral of a total derivative will be the same as the integral, uh, the sum of the integrals over all the faces. This is just the ordinary facts that the integral of a total derivative picks up the boundary. F boundary. So, so the integral over a cube of the t total derivative is the same as the integral over the boundary of the cube of this form, just by usual rules of integration. So we might think, since we're summing over all cubes, we're going to get a crazy number of boundary terms. We'll get this boundary term will appear as a, as a boundary of this cube, but it will also appear as a boundary of this cube, and so on. So we'll get a, all these boundary terms, but what we'll find is that most of, most of these boundary terms cancel except the ones on the boundary, on the boundary of the manifold here. So, so each k minus 1 dimensional face of M, which is in the interior, Uh, c will will contribute twice. So I have a k dimensional one, k minus one dimensional face in the interior. Here I'll draw it in pink. It contributes once from the boundary of this cube and once from the boundary of this cube. So what we want to show is that these cancel. And the reason they cancel is that they contribute with opposite signs. So let's see why this is true by kind of pulling them apart a little bit. So when I take the boundary of this square, I pick up the boundary integrals going in that direction. So in particular, this pink face We'll get a will be integrated in that way. Whereas well, this one, it's also going clockwise, but but it will give you the integral in the other direction. So they just cancel. So I've drawn this in two dimensions, but it, a similar argument applies in an arbitrary number of dimensions. Now, the only faces which don't get cancelled by this procedure are the ones which have 
a square only on one side. There's nothing on the other side to cancel that integral. So we're just left with So the sum over the faces of the boundary of M of the integral of eta, not that is just the integral over the boundary of M of this form. So there's some nice. Uh, Yes, question? I, I, I think the, the concept of pullback is kind of a bit confusing to people, but it's nothing... It's nothing mysterious, right? When I have a function and I integrate it, I only care about the values of that function on the region I'm integrating. What the function does at some faraway points doesn't matter. So the pullback of a differential form is just taking your differential form and looking what it does on that region. Because that, that's all that's going to contribute to the integral. So that's all it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. That's a good way to say it. Yeah. Yes, so because we, we're defining, we're, def we're saying that a coordinate patch on the on the boundary lives in a half space, so it always has one of the coordinates non-negative, so it never touches in the other the other half. So even if there are different coordinate patches, they'll all live in the same half space. Does that answer your question? Okay, so there's some f uh, kind of fun things you can derive from this. So here's one. So suppose we have is an n-dimensional manifold and y is an oriented k-dimensional manifold and omega is a k-form in m which is closed. Then the integral over y of omega doesn't change if we vary y. So this statement is just like the statement people are familiar with from contour integrals. So why is that? So if we have a one parameter family of submanifolds, yt, where y naught is equal to y, then I'm just gonna just kind of describe intuitively what's happening. So this is y naught, and over here some kind of wiggly thing. So y one. As I vary, as I vary y, they sweep out a cylinder. This is a cylinder. Y 
with boundary, say, y hat, where the boundary of y hat is y naught union y1. So then, the integral of d omega over this cylinder is the integral over the boundary of the cylinder of omega. The boundary has two pieces. One piece is the y0, which is what we originally started with, and the other piece is y1. So you might ask, why is there a minus sign? Well, the minus sign is because of the orientations. You know, we have y as some ori orientation, say y it goes that way. I have to orient the cylinder, maybe I orient it that way. <coughs> and then, uh, because this, this arrow points in at one end and out at the other end, this one must go that way. And just in the same way, a line integral, the contribution of the endpoints has a different sign. It's the same thing. So here's, here's a kind of fun example of this. Is, uh, suppose I have a region in the complex plane, an f z z bar, a function on you, then d of f z z bar dz, we have this, this one form, f times dz. Yeah? If we have a one parameter family, sorry, param short for parameter, I don't know. My so, so if we have a function on a region on the complex plane, we can take a one form, f times dz, where dz is dx plus i dy, and you can check that this is closed if and only if f satisfies the cauchy riemann equations. So the cauchy women equations are, of course, that uh, df dz bar, which is half of df dx minus i df dy equals 0. So applying this kind of story about how the integral of a closed one form doesn't depend on the contour. To these particular closed one forms, it g gives you the usual story of uh, contour, contour integration. So this implies that the integral over a contour dz doesn't change. I think it's holomorphic. If we vary the contour. Mm hmm. Oh, there's only two pieces of the boundary. Uh, because the cylinder, I, I'm, I'm thinking of like literally a cylinder. It's two boundaries, one at zero, one at one. Two boundary components. So I'm taking my original manifold and moving it along. And as it evolves in time, it sweeps out 
uh, something a bit like a cylinder, which is two boundaries, the original time and the final time. In the middle, there's no boundary. <laughs> yes, exactly. I didn't, I, you know, this was a more math course. Yeah, if there's like a math course, you'd have to be very careful about all these things, but yeah, I'm thinking of a smooth variation. So you don't want to change the topology, you don't want to kind of rip, rip it up into pieces or anything. Right? Okay. So I, I haven't explained very much why um, why cohomology is a is a topological invariant. So I want to spend a few minutes explaining that these points, and then I'd like to move on to explain, if I have time, the connection between the RAM forms and gate. So if we have two manifolds, and a map from M to N, you have seen we get a map F upper star, which takes a K form on M to a K form on N. So if I have a closed K form, then we let I'm going to use this notation with the square brackets around omega, which is cohomology th to be the corresponding cohomology class. So, yeah, there are some questions about the meaning of these equivalence relations. So, the way to think about it is. You know, this might be a gauge field. And this cohomology class is the gauge equivalence class. Adding on D of a K minus one form is like a gauge transformation. And in fact, if this was a one form, it would be literally a gauge transformation. Ah, oh, I always make this mistake. Thank you. I always get confused between M and N. So this should be N as well. So we can consider F star of omega, and this is closed. So. So we can ask, uh, does this cohomology class only depend on cohomology class of omega? And the answer is yes. If I do, if I change omega by d of something by like a gauge transformation. Then I also change f star of omega by a gauge transformation. So if we change omega, it gets changed to omega plus d eta. Then f star of omega gets changed to f star of omega plus f star d eta, which is f star of omega. Plus d f star eta. So this d of f star eta is like a gauge transformation by f star of eta. So so it follows that f star of omega only depends on omega. Now 
the other cohomology class omega. This means we have a map at the level of cohomology. So I'll continue to call it F star. I hope this won't cause confusion. So the first thing that is going to tell us about why cohomology is insensitive to small perturbations will be that this map does not change if we... So this F star in cohomology does not change if we vary F in a smooth way. So, so if f of t is as smooth of maps from m to n, then d by dt of f star fr mapping from hk n to h k m is zero. So if I have a smooth family of maps and I pull back a cohomology class, then that the, the, the resulting cohomology class does not change as I vary over this family. So why why is this? Let me let me, let me quickly give. I mean, this is an important statement, which is kind of worth remembering. But let me quickly give uh, a proof of this statement. So the proof itself maybe is not so important. So we define f hat, which goes from m times time to n by f hat of m comma t is f lower t of m. So there's a, we're, we're saying we, we view time as a parameter in the map. It takes a pointer in my manifold times time to the value of this one parameter family of maps at that point. And then we write, if I have a closed k-form, then we can write, I can pull it back using f hat. And this will have two pieces, one of which is just the pullback using this one parameter family of maps. And the other of which is just something else, which depends on dt. So here what we're saying is, well, this is some form on this manifold. So there is a piece which has a dt and a piece which has no dt. We're writing it as a sum of the piece with no dt and the piece with one dt. Now, d f hat star omega is equal to 0. So I'll probably have to go a little fast here, so maybe don't worry if it's on. Do you clear? Yeah. Here? This one? This is meant to be a uh, little omega is a f is a form. It's in capital omega k of n. Is that yeah. Oh no! I, 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 yeah, I really meant. I really, I really meant this because I want to.
Mhm. Yes, it's essential that this is zero. And, and I want to, I, I don't want to pass to cohomology quite yet. I'll do that at the end, the argument. Okay. So let's just look at what this equation says. This equation has two terms. It'll have a term which involves a dt and which does not involve a dt. So d f hat star of omega is, we'll have a term which is like d on m, the Durama operator on m, plus dt del t, plus, this is actually a minus for sine reasons, So we're just using the fact that the Durama operator on this manifold is a sum of the one here and the one here. So this argument is really too technical maybe for this course. But and now, now let's just look at the various terms, and we'll set everything to 0. So this piece doesn't have a dt. So this guy must be 0 just by itself. So this piece, piece is 0. And this piece these is the sum of two pieces, each of which has a dt. So these guys must, this, these must sum to zero. So we conclude that the variation, if I, ve if I differentiate with respect to t what this family of things looks like, it is the Durham operator applied to something. Therefore, the cohomology class doesn't change. It's, I haven't told you what it is. I mean, I'm just saying, whatever this guy is, it's a form on this manifold, and let's expand it. it it'll, it'll have a piece with no dt, which is this, and a piece which, have a d which contains a dt, and but I'm just calling it a t. I haven't given, haven't given you a formula for it or anything like that. It's just we know there must be something like that. Okay, so, so this kind of slightly technical argument tells us that this operation on cohomology doesn't change if we vary the map. It's, this is really similar to the kinds of things we were discussing earlier. You know, if I vary a contour, the integral doesn't change. It's a very similar statement because I integrals can be defined in terms of the pullback on cohomology. So the real utility of it is um, so we can use a statement to say that if we have two, two manifolds which are not the same, but one can be squished into the other, then they must have the same cohomology. So what does it mean to have two manifolds, one which can be squished into the other? So we have the following uh, So a uh, submanifold n inside of m is a uh, called a deformation retract if there is a one parameter family of maps ft from m to M with the following properties. So firstly, Ft, if I take a point in N, I get back that point in N. 
Secondly, f0 of, of any point gives me back that point. So if I take this family of maps, at t equals 0, it's just the identity mapping. This does nothing. And as I move it along, the third property tells us that f1 of any point is in n. So at t equals 0, it does nothing. And as, Im as I increase t, it squishes things down until eventually everything is squashed down to, to this submanifold. So kind of picture to bear in mind might be a circle living inside a cylinder. And my one parameter family of maps just kind of squashes everything down to the middle. Like that. So being a deformation retract like this, uh, well mathematicians would say they have the same topology. They have the same essential topological features. These little kind of fuzzy, fuzzy things that one can squash away, they're not important. This cylinder, this circle in the middle can't be squashed away, but all this kind of nonsense over here is not, is not important for the, for the topology. So here's some examples. So if I take the origin in ORN, so this is a deformation retraction. So this is really easy to see. We just define FT of x to be 1 minus t of x. Then when t is 0, I just get back what I started with. And when t is 1, I go back. I say I'm squished down to the origin. And it's very simple. So if I take the sphere, this is also a deformation retraction. So, how does this work? We define f t of x. So the intuition would be, I should take a point on this. I take a point in in, in this space, and I take the corresponding point on the sphere, which goes in the same direction, and just want to draw a straight line from one to the other. And that's that's how I squish down. So the formula for that straight line. Is it's uh, t times x over the size of x plus 1 minus t times x. So when t is 0, I just get back what I started with. And when t is 1, this piece drops off, and I get a vector on the sphere, because this, this guy will have length 1, because I've divided by its length. So the reason for saying all this is if I have a deformation retraction, then the cohomology of n is equal to the cohomology of m. So all the cohomology classes really just come from this essential topology, which can't be removed. Here's the proof. We have this family of maps. Now, at the level of cohomology, Ft star from H k of m to H k of m 
this map is independent of T. So let's figure let's look at what this map does when t is one t is zero. So f star zero. Well, at zero, we th this mapping does nothing. It's the identity map. So this is the identity map from h k m to h k m. On the other hand, f star one. Well, when it's 1, we're squishing everything down to n. So when it's 1, uh, this, this map will factor through. The map So since these maps are the same, we're saying, well, whatever class we get here, it can't go to 0 in the cohomology of n, because if it did, it would go to 0 when t was 0, which it doesn't. So, so this shows. This map has no kernel. And there's a similar argument. S shows that it's it's on to. So I hope this wasn't I feel this wasn't the clearest point. Uh So the the way the way to think about this argument is the map the pullback map in cohomology doesn't depend doesn't change when I vary a map. So if I can squish everything down everything down to this submanifold, then all cohomology classes must come from that submanifold. Because when a t was zero, we see all we see all cohomology classes, and when I go down, we just just see things coming from that submanifold. Um Okay, yeah. Oh, of course, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. I can't, can't really fit it in, but thank you. So this is good because before we knew this, we didn't really know very much about cohomology. We didn't even know that the, com that the ball had no interest in cohomology. But now we know that cohomology can't tell the difference between a ball and a point. So now we can compute the cohomology of, of a ball. So this tells us The cohomology of or n is equal to or if k is equal to zero and zero if k is not zero. Because this over here is the cohomology of a point. There's no interesting cohomology in or n. And it also tells us that say the cohomology of or n minus the origin is the same thing as the cohomology of the sphere. Okay. So 
The next thing we might try to do, if you wanted to pursue the computations of cohomology further, you could ask, how do we compute the cohomology of a circle? How do we compute the cohomology of a sphere? Um, but after thinking about it, I've decided that it's just going to be too much to explain the methods to do this. There's a certain amount of algebra. Um, so I'll just, I'll just give you the answers and maybe some... I'll give you the answers in one computational trick, which is useful. The cohomology of the n-sphere is equal to, or if i is equal to 0, 0 if i is between 0 and n, or if i is equal to n. Okay. So the, the intuition one has here, yeah? Um there is there is a more general s I mean there's a slightly more general notion of like being topologically equivalent called homotopy equivalence and uh, cohomology is invariant under that also and the proof is basically the same it's just it just seemed easier to prove this case um what 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 other equivalences were you thinking about like what what other Operations where you're thinking cohomology might be unchanged under. I don't know. It seems. I, I mean, I, 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 I sort of see your point. I mean. I, I in practice, deformation retraction is, is kind of good enough to get at the essence of being having the same topology. So, in particular, you know, you know I, we didn't say this, but our definition of cohomology didn't refer to any other struct. It was just it didn't refer to any way of measuring length on on the manifold or anything like that. It, so it's already insensitive to like changing the shape of it. That was true from the beginning. So deformation retraction tells us a bit more. It's insensitive under making it a bit bigger in a kind of fuzzy way, which it isn't. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think I was really unclear at this point. Sorry about that. Uh, so let me do it over here. F F one is maps everything down down to n. So F one is a map from m to m, but actually it lies in this subspace n. So F one star is a map H K M to H K M, but it factors as, just like F1 factors as squishing down to n and then including HKM2 HKN2 HKM. So this, so like we have some mapping from here to here, and it's written here like, a, you know, multiplying two matrices. But we know that this composed map is the identity map because it, this composed map doesn't change when I change the value of t, so a t equals zero was the identity map. So now, if this operator had some kernel, then this composed operator also would have had a kernel, and therefore the identity map would have had a kernel, but the identity map doesn't have a kernel. So that's how you know. OK, 
Any, any other questions? So let me, let me write down some examples of cohomology groups. So here's the sphere. If I take the, t the torus, the two-dimensional torus, um, it's or when i is 0. It's two-dimensional when i is 1, it's or when i is 0, or i is 2, sorry. So the intuition here is the torus has these two cycles, one going that way and one going that way. Those two one-dimensional cycles are related to this two-dimensional two space of cohomology in degree one. Yeah. There you can write down one forms, you know, d theta, d theta prime, whose integral around these cycles is 2 pi. And then there's a two form and the constant zero form. Uh, So as I said, I've decided not to, I mean, that the method for computing cohomology is called meyer torus sequence, which is you take, basically you take your space, you break it up into pieces, and then you compute those pieces. Yeah. Could you speak a bit louder, sorry? Oh, what's the mean? What's the physical meaning of it? So, okay. So this here we have this two-dimensional space. So I can ask: Suppose I want to study solutions of the Yang-Mills equation, which are massless. I mean, which are like there's you know I have a four-dimensional gauge theory on a torus. I have two compact directions. What are the zero modes? So this will be them. There, you know. So these cohomology groups often have, uh, have interpretations in, in, ter in those, in terms of kaluza klein reduction, for instance. Um, was that the kind of thing you were? Yes. So these 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 cohomology groups, uh, for a three. Well, I mean, th these cohomology groups have no reference, you know, their definition has no reference to physics. People came up with them because they wanted to study invariants which will distinguish manifolds. They wanted to put precision on the intuition that the torus has two cycles. It's kind of, it's very easy to be hand wavy about these intuitions about how many cycles a manifold has. You have to be, cohomology allows you to be precise about it. But they do have interpretations in physics. That's the intuitive interpretation of the answer that this cohomology is two-dimensional. Uh, there are physical setups where the Ram operator is the BRST operator, in which case you are computing what you said. If you're interested in that, you can look at Witten's paper on uh, Morse theory from 1989. Uh, okay, so the final thing I wanted to say, but if you wanted to get a feeling for how to compute cohomology groups, you know, there's some uh, there's some techniques called the meyer torus sequence, it's a standard technique for doing it. Um, but here's a here's a useful rule. So if M is a manifold, you define the order characteristic of M to be the, the alternating sum of the dimensions of the cohomology. So it turns out by uh, by the um, chern gauss bonnet theorem that this this quantity is an average of the curvature of the manifold. 
If I have a manifold with no curvature, this quantity must be zero. Conversely, if I have a manifold for, this for which this quantity is non-zero, then no matter how I, I kind of put a metric on it, the curvature, there must be curvature somewhere. But so the rule for calculating this is if M is a union of two pieces, the other characteristic of M is that of U plus V minus that of the intersection. So with this, you can play around and compute the, uh, compute the Euler, Euler characteristic of various spaces. For, for example, the Euler characteristic of the n-sphere is 1 plus minus 1 to the n, and so on. Okay. So for the last half an hour, I wanted to explain um, how th the theory of different, yeah? Hmm. Well, so let's say you're trying to compute the first cohomology of the plane compared to the first cohomology of the plane with a point removed. So on the plane with the point removed, I could write 1 over z dz. And this is a closed one form on the plane with the point removed. But it, it has a pole at the origin, so it does not exist on the whole plane. So that's, I mean, that's the easiest. What does he, does that does that answer your question in any way or I mean it, it is a bit subtle because you know locally everything is the same. So if you try to compute the differential equation in local coordinates, you're always going to find the same answer. The reason why you define dif different answer globally is you know to do with patching these local pieces together. That is, you know. Say, suppose you're trying to compute h1. Locally, every closed one form is d of something. So you might think, well, therefore, globally, every closed one form must be d of something. But that's not true, because you try to patch together the things which it's d of, and they don't quite patch. So here's the, the interpretation of this stuff in physics. So to, to, to get to the physical interpretation, we need, need to define one more operation, which is called the hodge star operation. So, so this is an operation which is depends on more than, than just the topology of M. It depends on, on actually how you measure distance. And what it does is it takes a k form to an n minus k form, where n is the dimension. And the, the formula on flat space Um, star of dx i1 
dx i k is equal to epsilon i1 i k j1 j n minus k dx j1 dx j n minus k and this is a factor of 1 over n minus k factorial. So it's just some formula, but the thing you notice is, you know, this dx i1 up to dx i k misses some xi's, and star of it picks up precisely the ones which this guy misses. So in dimension 4, which is the most important for our purposes, we have, for example, star of dx1 y h dx2 is equal to dx3 y h dx4. Star of dx1 y h dx3 is equal to minus dx2 y h dx4. And And dx1, dx4 becomes dx2, y2, dx3. And here the minus sign is because 1, 3, 2, 4 is not quite cyclically ordered. We have to switch the 3 and the 2. brings up a minus sign. And when n is 4, star and star is the identity. Okay. So this seems to come out of nowhere, but the reason for introducing this operation is it gives a very slick way of writing down uh, Maxwell's equations. Uh, So what Maxwell's equations say is if M is a four-manifold, which we think of as space-time, um, the electromagnetic field strength is a two-form. It's a two-form in M. And Maxwell's equations are the following. Df equals zero and d star f equals zero. Okay, any questions? So, if you really want, you can, you know, work in flat space and expand it out in coordinates, and you'll get a bunch of equations that you would no normally see. Uh, One advantage of this formulation is it's kind of obviously relativistically invariant, because I <laughs> Yeah. Well, you notice that it's a closed two form. So I can take its cohomology class, and this is a topological invariant of, of the configuration of my gauge field. So it's so that's one simple way. Yes, and you know you can see funny properties of the of electromagnetism because the space is non-trivial topology, right? So normally, if you work in flat space, this will not have an interesting cohomology class. But if we're on something where I have 
know, where I've removed a line from space, then this will ha could have an interesting cohomology class. And that's an interesting topological property of Maxwell's equations. With that, uh, yes, I haven't. I mean, there's a similar formulation if I wanted to couple to a fermionic field, but I haven't done so. It's a bit more complicated. But Okay, so if we have a surface in our manifold, then we can measure the integral over sigma of f and the integral over sigma of star f. So both of these, these are some very simple observables in the gauge theory. But these are topological observables. They don't depend on where I put the surface. on kind of uh, so they don't change if we vary the surface so what this guy does is it measures something like the flux of the electric field with the electric flux And this one is related to magnetic flux. Let's give you an example. I can take my, my field strength to be 1 over uh, x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared, 3 over 2, x1 dx1 dx2 minus x2 dx1 dx3 plus x3 dx1 dx2. And you can check. In fact, I um, may, may have asked you to check. This, this is was on the homework. So this is a, I want this to be on fo in four dimensions. So there's another dimension independent of time that it's closed. And you can also calculate That star of f is one over plus x two squared plus x three squared half <laughs> times uh uh, sum x i the x i weight d t. So star of f. If you look at this equation, that th I mean, going from here to here, you just have to do some manipulations with what star is. But if you look at this equation, you'll see, well, some x i d x i that looks like it's uh, applying the Dirac operator to something like this. 
this should be 3 over 2. So that's his d of maybe minus d. Uh, so star, uh, so because of this, you know, d squared is zero. So this equation implies that d star f equals zero, and that this this f therefore solves Maxwell's equation. This one here? Yeah. Mm. Thank you, yes. Sorry about that. So this is a... Uh, so this solution to, to Maxwell's equations is called the Dirac monopole. The, if I take the integral of this guy over the two sphere, where the x is equal to one, this is, you know, some constant, something like two pi. I don't, I don't, I don't remember the precise constant. So, uh, yeah, being a mathematician, I always get confused between electric and magne magnetic because they are the same. In the equations, there's a symmetry, so it's not. Uh, So yeah, so Dirac had some kind of <laughs> fun argument with, with this about ma magnetic monopoles. Uh, and I suppose this is the very simplest example of a solutions to uh, Maxwell's equations, which has an interesting topological property. I can uh, I can measure, you know, I plug in this topological observable of the flux around the two-sphere, and it's not zero. Let's see what else. There's a few a few other kind of kind of fun things one can do with uh, with differential forms and gauge theory. So let me yeah uh, yeah. I'm see I'm getting confused between, between uh, electric and magnetic at this point. So maybe uh, maybe I should have started with star f, but the equations are symmetric under sending f to star f. So it's it's kind of a convention, what you call electric and magnetic. Uh, so, so one one go one goes on to study non -abit yeah. Two invariants that I can integrate over the whole manifold. Like a scalar? Yes. Yeah, that's right. So there's so the the, the I think the two things you're thinking about are like F wedge star wedge star F and F wedge F. So this one, this one is the Yang-Mills action. And Maxwell's equations are local minima of the integral of this action. And this one, it's sometimes called the theta angle. And it's another measure of topological features. Uh, of the gauge field. Is that is that your question? Uh, 
I mean, if you write these out in coordinates, you'll find some expressions that might be familiar to you. But yeah. No, because it's a two form. Because f if f f was only like one component, dx one wedge dx two, that would be zero. But because it's a bunch of sum of things. It's graded anti-symmetric. It's because if if I switch the order, I pick up a sign depending on the degree of these guys. If they were both one forms, I pick up a minus sign. But because they're both two forms, I pick up a plus sign. So it's also fun to think about the electromagnetic potential. This is a one form, A with dA equals F up to gauge equivalence uh, A plus A. A goes to A plus Eta. So, so the electromagnetic potential was, of course, something in the original formulation of Maxwell's equations. It was all about this guy F, and he thought, oh, you know, sometimes we can write F in terms of A, where A is an auxiliary, completely meaningless object. But uh, later, it was argued by uh, Aronov Bohm that actually A is, is kind of fundamental and has some meaning. So let me explain what they were doing, as, as best I understand it, given that I'm not a physicist. So they study those A with dA equals zero. So that means they have no field strength. And again, according to the original formulation of Maxwell's equations, studying these guys which have no field strength, well, you think the whole thing would be completely trivial, but it's not. Now, we already know what classifies such A's. They're closed one forms, modulo D, modulo gauge transformations, which is adding on D of a zero form. So such A's. are the same thing as first cohomology classes in our manifold, where m is space, space-time. So actually, I hope that people who know this stuff better than, like, who know the physics of this better than me will correct me when if I make a mistake, when I make a mistake. Um, so what's an example? So if space is OR3 minus a line, so I've, I have this line removed, so maybe So I'm not allowed to hit the origin in the x x1, x2 plane. Then, well, intuitively, we can see that there should be some, some cycle. Right here, there's some cycle going around this line, which can't be contracted. But we, we, we know a little more now, and we have some, some feeling for cohomology. Um, well, the space-time time is or 4 minus a plane and this deformation retracts
onto a circle. By the arguments we had before, we can just squish everything down where there's one part which can't be removed, which is this circle going around this, this line. So now, of course, H1 of a circle is R. So H1 of space-time is also R. So that means there's, there's some gauge field, which is unique, up to scale and up to gauge equivalence, which represents this cohomology class. And one way to write it is it's 1 over x1 squared plus x2 squared x1 dx2 minus x2 dx1. Okay, so, so next, Aron of Bohm said, well, can we make some kind of measurement of uh, a measurement of this potential, this gauge field, which which is non-trivial, even though it has non-trivial um, field strength. So what they did was they considered the integral around the circle of A and I think they had an exponential. So this is called a Wilson line. This is a special case of an operation which is very important in QCD. And what they said, well, their interpretation was that if we send a charged particle along the circle, the phase changes by by this factor. And uh, of course, precisely because A is a non-trivial cohomology class, this factor is not equal to 0. It's some constant, maybe pi or something. Um, we can always put, a put in a some constant here to adjust the value so that this is really a measurable effect. Uh, okay. So what, what other fun things can one do? Yeah, so I think I'm kind of uh, out of time, and y you know, so I think this like this topic in physics, I think it really comes into its own in two areas, which is when when you're studying string theory, you're not just talking about gauge fields; you might have fields which are forms of higher degrees, higher gauge fields, and instead of ha integrating them over a contour, you want to integrate them over manifolds, of various dimensions. So then, the language of cohomology is like a super useful language for understanding the story. And the other place where it's really useful is in an area I don't understand at all, which is the kind of topological uh, methods and condensed matter. So I, I don't know much about this area, but they, they, use, they use all kinds of very fancy algebraic topology, far more fancy than this in, in what they do. So, okay, so I'd like to stop there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Questions? So don't wait until the next lecture because this is his last lecture. So. Uh, I have one question about the, when you were doing the um, the derivation for the homology classes of a product of m times the interval. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just wondering when you have two manifolds in general, what's the rule to calculate the uh, the forms of the product of two manifolds. Is there any well, general result or? Well, th I mean, there is. So the, the real is kind of, for forms, it's easy to understand. You, you work in local coordinates. One is coordinates x, the other is coordinate y. And then a form is some product of dx's times the product of dy's. That's so that, that's all it is. So just some, something built up from some number of things on one side and some number of things on the other side. Uh, uh, so 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 that's the reason why you write some one form that does not depend on t and the other that depends on yeah on exactly because on on the interval is either it's a zero form or, or it has a dt in it you know? uh, yeah it makes sense S yes uh, okay and maybe one extra comment uh, when you talk about the solution to Maxwell equations uh, it's just a remark that this is only valid for um, this manifold right. It's a solution for this manifold where we were talking about in this example, right? Yes. Is it, yeah, yeah we, we, we fix a manifold and we study Maxwell's equations on that manifold. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the context of differential forms, what's the difference between Minkowski and space-time space and R4? Because... No, no, there's no difference. And if you am doing... Maxwell theory in curved space time, what will be the difference? Yeah, so what I didn't explain, I didn't give you the formula for the operator star in curved space time, but if you, if you, if you, uh, if you write it down, the operator star involves the, um, the metric tensor. Oh, okay, all right. And there's a, f you know, because you need to raise and lower some indices in some way. Okay, so let's thank Kevin for his wonderful set of lectures. Okay, so we meet at 2.30, and then we'll go to dinner at 7. So the dinner is all you can eat, so you don't have to eat so much for lunch.